Hi everybody and welcome to another digital piano review here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison and in today's video, a first look at Casio's PXS 7000. Boy, is this piano getting a lot of hype out there. Really glad we had a chance uh, to get an early look at one ourselves. Uh, we've really been enjoying it. We're gonna be talking to you about the sound and the action and a full uh, top to bottom review of this instrument. So thanks so much for tuning in. If it's the first time that you are seeing us here on YouTube, we'd really appreciate if you hit that subscribe and notification bell, because we'd love to see you back as a uh, regular viewer, commenter, whatever level of participation you are comfortable with. Without further ado, let's dive right in to today's review of the PXS 7000. So my expectations of this instrument uh, were pretty high and it started with the realization that at a price point this was going to come in around 2500 US, uh, 32, 3300 Canadian, uh, which is you know our home base uh, and relative price points comparative to currencies around the world. Uh, and so that would make it one of the most expensive portable Casio products that they'd ever released and really a very clear warning shot across the bow to Roland's FP series, which uh, you know dominates this whole like all-in-one portable thing. Yamaha has the P125 and the P515, but not nearly the breadth of offering in that specific onboard speaker, whole, uh, you know, all-in-one uh, type of approach. Kawhi's got their ES520 and ES920. Uh, but Casio with the 1100 and 3100 weren't really quite considered uh, true competitors in that space. Uh, and so the 7000 is, is obviously uh, their um, you know, brand new entrant uh, into that and they're being pretty serious about its release. Uh, and my overall impressions are that although the approach to uh, the user interface is quite different, it doesn't really draw on a lot of the usual traditions of uh, user interface that some of those other ones do. Uh, the look is quite a bit different. The stand, which we're definitely going to talk about, uh, was quite, about di quite a bit different. But the musical experience, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. I think they've actually come up with a product that a lot of customers are going to consider uh, in those same types of price ranges and conversations as say an FP60X or an FP90X or a Kawhi ES920 or even maybe a Yamaha P515. Let's now drill into the specifics. We're going to talk about sound and all the aspects of its sound generation and the onboard tones. Then we're going to talk about action and finally we're going to uh, cover some of the less musical aspects such as stand and other features. So. Let's get into sound. First important thing to know is that this instrument draws on a lot of the same samples and tech that are loaded into the GP310 and 510 hybrid pianos from Casio. Uh, and users who are familiar with that will know it for two good reasons. One is that they have this grand hybrid action, which actually was pretty successful. I mean, it kept costs down. Uh, it was uh, certainly more simplified than the full acoustic actions that you get on like the Kawhi Novus 10 or uh, Yamaha's uh, N3, the Avant Grand type of thing. But for its price range, it, it actually did a pretty good job of simulating a, a grand piano. But the second reason you'll know it is they did a killer version of delivering three great samples of a Homburg Steinway, New York Steinway, and a Seebeckstein 282. Uh, they were really meticulously uh, captured um, and in my view you'd almost have to get into the VST world uh, to find samples that were better done um, and offering a breadth of, of, of uh, pianos across different brands uh, than uh, you get on those Casio's 310 or 510. I love how Kawhi has done their SKEX in the Nova series. Um, with all of the of the multi sampling, I mean that's that's beautiful. But it's one piano, 
and although you can modify it, you know, you've still got that Shigeru tone. So the Casio's uh, offered some breadth there that was really cool. That sound technology is now in this S7000. Uh, and so you've got the Hamburg Grand, you've got the New York Grand, you've got the Berlin Grand. Uh, and they sound great. So here is the Hamburg Grand. Then you've got uh, a bright version of that, which I hate, honestly. Never a fan. I mean, whether it's the Casio or the Yamaha or the Quiet, like these kind of built-in, like harsh, either uh, high pass or low pass filters that they put on it or some extreme EQ to artificially generate these other samples. I, you know, not my thing. I guess there would be specific situations, like let's say you were hooked up to a PA or an amp and it was just feeding you way too many highs and you couldn't do anything about it. I could see there being use, but if you've got control over everything else, personally, I don't see why you'd ever use that. So I usually just skip over those. Here's the New York. And then the Berlin. So if you're gonna be playing acoustic piano on this thing, those are the three you're gonna be choosing from. And if you find a favorite, there are lots of ways to go in and customize that sound. So it's a very similar approach to what you can do with the virtual technician on Kawai or the piano designer on Roland. Yamaha has some options within some of their apps to get a little bit granular. Uh, but this really uh, is, a, you know, is, is a true editor uh, and you can get in there and affect things such as string resonance, damper resonance, open string resonance, aliquot, which is you know also known as duplex. And well, depends if you're a, a, a Blutner fan because aliquot means a different thing if you're uh, talking about Blutner pianos. But otherwise, it usually just refers to like a duplex. Uh, damper noise, key off noise, key on noise. So you can go in and edit the parameters for all of those things. Uh, and then you've also got sound mode where you can edit things like 
the reverb and then the surround effect. Um, I'm not using the surround effect right now. I have a little bit of just default reverb uh, turned on. So those are your acoustic piano sounds if you're going to be playing uh, inside uh, this instrument, generally speaking. Then you get into uh, this option, which is kind of fun, um, which is they name a, a lot of the uh, songs, or, or rather they match uh, piano tones uh, to go along with very famous songs that have prominent you know, piano uh, presence. Wow, that was an unintended alliteration. Uh, so, like, imagine. Uh, what else do they have? Lady Piano. I don't know, that could be Lady Gaga, that could be... Uh, Sure, clock. You got the idea. So this is kind of fun that they've done this. And they've nailed a lot of those samples very, very, very well. Thousand piano. I'm sure there's going to be lots of review videos out there and this thousand, <laughs> thousand miles is suddenly going to get this resurgence because everybody's playing that lick. Ragtime piano, stage piano, so you get the idea. Uh, once you get out of the pianos into e-pianos and uh, a lot of those other ones, the e-piano thing, it does the same thing. It sort of has the Herbie thing. Ever. Uh, still crazy. So they found, oh, just the way. Sorry, this could go on for a long time. So I won't. Not in love, storm ride. Oh, actually a lot of fun. I'll admit it, it's a lot of fun. So you've got a nice selection of e-pianos as well and a really interesting way to uh, pick it. Uh, now, at any point you can hit enter and you can, you'll get into that tone category. Um, you can pick your tone category here, so best hit pianos, which is what we were just doing. Classic pianos. And then you get into your organs. That's kind of weird. I would have expected the controls to sort of turn the Leslie on, turn the Leslie off. But I guess the Leslie effect is kind of baked into the sample in that case. All in all, because we're not going to go through 400 of them, because there are 400 sounds, available uh, on this instrument. 
And for the most part, the quality of those uh, samples is actually really solid. Uh, so you get into synth pad, let's listen to some of those. Tons of stuff. Slow synth string. Yeah, that's nice. So you get the idea, and the navigation through all of the sound categories is, is actually really easy. Um, I like it. Uh, and then you're into your general MIDI tones. So all of that stuff we were covering wasn't even part of the general MIDI, that was actually uh, Casio's own samples. So easy nav, tons of sounds to choose from, and at its core for us piano players, uh, a lot of a similar e-piano stuff, but the big deal being that we have added those three sample sets from their hybrids, the 310, 510. So uh, Hamburg, Berlin, uh, and New York. Uh, now, the engine, 256 notes worth of max polyphony, which is great because some of those sounds are so lush you're going to want to load them up with a couple of uh, layers, I am quite sure. Uh, and that is driving also a four speaker system, um, eight times four, so 32 watts worth of rated power out of there. Uh, you know, uh, some of my commenters will be the first to mention that just that number on its own isn't necessarily very meaningful. Um, but uh, the fact that the four speakers are there uh, is kind of meaningful because that's where you start to get some really nice sense of breadth of sound presentation, 100%. The other thing is on the outer uh, speakers, uh, according to Casio, there are some diffusers that uh, kind of deflect some of the sound even further west and east uh, than otherwise they would be. So you get a really true sense of uh, space. Uh, there are some tone ports uh, in front of where those two speakers are. So you get some of that, that secondary uh, tone coming off the back of the cone, which isn't really like it's not creating a ton of sound, but I guess it just does give your ear a little more uh, access to some of the highs that are maybe coming off in a passive way from the back of the speakers. And another thing they've done with the sound engine is they have, uh, I guess, programmed, it's, it's both some uh, spatial simulation as well as some EQ settings. You can tell it whether you're sitting in the middle of a room, whether you're sitting up against a wall, whether you've got it without the stand on top of the table, or what they just call standard, which is, I guess, n nothing, maybe? Uh, but that's pretty easy to access. You're, you basically just hop into your function menu, it's within your sound, and then you go to piano position, and you can see it right now we've got it center because we're kind of in the center of a room, but you can set it on table, you can put it a wall or a standard, so we're just going to leave it center for now. But that's a really interesting uh, feature because it certainly does play with your, your sense of space around the piano. So. Uh, very cool that they've done that as a feature. We're going to come back and talk about action now. Uh, so I'm going to throw some of those specs up on the screen. Thank you so much for being with us this far at our first look at the 7000. We'll see you in just a second. So we've got to talk about the action. Uh, First thing I'm going to mention is I have done uh, quite an extensive comparison between the action on the PXS 1100 and 3100 
and the action which appears on this new series, the 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. They are not the same action. Uh, and in not just kind of a superficial way, there's actually some meaningful differences. Uh, if not on paper, then certainly in how they behave. So if you want to really drill into the differences between the actions already out there and this action, I would suggest clicking on the link uh, that we'll put, uh, if we can, on the screen. If not, certainly it's down in the description. Go find it if this is a major point of interest. Not going to go that in depth right now in this video because uh, we've already done it before. But I will still talk about the action, generally speaking. So this is part of a very compacted series of actions that Casio uh, puts out. And this is one of the biggest ways in which they have created weight savings and space savings for this whole Privia line. It's got a very short pivot length, probably the shortest pivot length for weighted key action in the entire industry. Uh, so it creates some tricky weighting problems for Casio, which I think they've dealt with in an intelligent way. Um, and for this action, there are several things that have been changed over the last one. Uh, in short, we have got a much quieter action. The mechanical sound on this action is really uh, super, super diminished. Like it seems honestly almost half as quiet uh, or half as loud, I guess would be the uh, than the earlier one. So mechanically, it feels tighter and it's quieter. Uh, there's more cushioning quite obviously on the way down as well as on the way up. And there doesn't feel like there is, there is as much uh, give in that back hinge um, when you're applying some lateral force to the key. So it feels tighter uh, and it feels, and because of the, of the cushioning, it just feels more solid. Uh, second difference is that they've put um, wood siding on the key. So it gives it the appearance um, that this is a hybrid key. It's not solid wood through the middle of the key. Um, you may find comments out there where that's being criticized because of course there are some other pianos out there uh, that do have solid wood key, but there's some really great actions that do not. Roland PHA50 would be one of them. It does not have a solid wood key. It's just got the, the wood down the side. So what does the wood do? Well, a couple of things. For one, it makes the key quieter because um, any mechanical sound or, or physical impact sound from your nail or your, your finger uh, is really dampened by that wood. Uh, so it makes just, just that on its own makes the action a little more quiet. It does also seem to add some stiffness to the key. Uh, and third, there, you know, there may be some arguments, whether it's a strained argument or not, that putting uh, the wood down the side and creating um, uh, weight on the key, which is uniform across the whole key, is gonna create a more realistic dynamic resistance uh, than trying to accomplish that entirely through uh, counterweights. So, uh, that's some differences, not to mention that it's a completely new uh, surface. Uh, the key tops uh, on the white and the black keys feel a lot more realistic um, and a lot closer to an acoustic and less exaggerated than what you find on the 1100 and the 3100. So it's in a premium price point for this category of instrument. It feels like a premium key top which is really nice. Now there's two features that are typically discussed on actions that Casio doesn't mention, um, escapement and whether it's a double or a triple sensor. Uh, it definitely does not have any escapement, you can feel that, and it doesn't mention whether it has a triple sensor. Since Casio in the past has mentioned when there is a triple sensor included, my guess is that they probably have uh, not and this may still be a double sensor. Given the short, uh, uh, pivot length on the key. Perhaps the thought was that a triple sensor wasn't that meaningful uh, because you're unlikely to get this instrument being used in studio settings to input really accurate MIDI information into piano tracking or things like that. And uh, they're probably right. So inconclusive whether it's a double or triple, but the absence of the fact that they've said it probably means that we are uh, looking at a double sensor. Um, but my overall impressions of the action are positive. Whereas on the 1100, it always felt like you were uh, sort of having to just defend the fact that it was passable 
um, that it was okay, it wasn't gonna hold anybody back. I actually like playing this action. Uh, it isn't just okay, uh, it feels really good. This is an action that you know I would gig on for two, three hours and be really quite happy with. In fact, I have uh, every intention in the world within the next couple weeks to actually take this guy out and see how it feels and stands up over the course of a pretty rigorous two or three hour uh, gig. So stay tuned to see whether we actually get it out for that or not. We're gonna be back with the third section where we're gonna cover some of the more user interface stuff as well as the stand. I have to get to the stand. The new menu system and the accompanying user interface on this, generally speaking, this is a super intuitive uh, system to use. The function button gets you right into the menu and it's well marked. It's easy to navigate with this touch wheel and you can use you know, it as kind of a data wheel or you can use it as uh, like an up, down, uh, left, right, nav uh, type of a wheel. Uh, the exit, the enter, everything is, is super obvious, where you're trying to get to and, and what you're trying to do. Uh, there are also uh, a few other things that I not just find like good and solid, but I actually love about this interface. And it's these function keys. And I don't know whether other people are gonna make a big deal of this, but I sure am, because I think it's great. Uh, so these F1, 2, 3, and 4 keys can be used as registrations which is you know, not that unique. But what is unique is that you can go down and select this, uh, you know, right now it's on song play, but there are multiple presets which change the function of those keys. So right now it's in song play, so you can access uh, a song, you know, internal or from USB, uh, uh, surround mode, you can get to there, uh, piano position, you can get to there, mic effects because this does have a mic input uh, and then you've got uh, all of these various compress compression and uh, EQ effect settings on here. Tons of stuff for your onboard mic effect which is great. Um, song lesson, listening, standard, so there's your registration setting, there's your registration you know, piano collection, EP collection, you know, so in this particular case, you're actually, you know, assigning specific uh, patches to those. So this is like a, you know, a, a dynamic multi-assignable uh, set of four function keys, and they're editable as well. So as soon as you get up to 15, wait, I think you've got 15 to 30, so you've got 15, sets of these four keys, you can assign anything, any menu setting, any parameter that you want to quickly call up. I think that's awesome. Um, I wish, you know, more pianos had that option because it's that versus 32 buttons versus always or only being able to dig into the menu. This is a really great, great way to pull out some of that functionality uh, out of the menu, deep in the menu, uh, so that you can use it live totally customized to your own needs. I really like that, I think that's great. Uh, we've got, as you can see, uh, two quarter inch outs. Uh, we've got the microphone in, we already mentioned that. We've got the headphone, quarter inch and 3.5 mil. And then while we're over here, let's also talk about uh, this expression one, expression two button, as well as this control button, which is uh, in kind of a modulation. And then you've got a pitch bender, uh, which fairly self-explanatory. By default, uh, let's just get back to this one right here. So by default, this top button is actually assigned to an arpeggiator. And of course, if you want to have the arpeggiator doing your thing, there is probably a mode here where you can automatically pull up. There we go, control. Uh, so here's your control mode. You can get right into 
and that's just to turn it on and off. Transpose. Yeah, so there's your EX1 button and EX2 button assign. Um, app would be for the Casio Music Space. So anyway, uh, some interesting approaches over there. And then finally, because I've been talking about it the whole video, I need to make mention of this stand. Uh, and I'm going to say this, and I genuinely mean it. This is the most rugged, solidly built uh, stand to go along with a portable piano that I have ever seen in my entire career in the business. Bar none. Uh, this is like it's a tank. It doesn't budge a millimeter when you get it together. Uh, the legs are solid wood and they're not uh, like super thin. There is absolutely zero wobble to this piano whatsoever and it looks great. Um, this stand on its own, if you were to buy it and you were buying it from a company normally associated with premium digital piano products, I don't know, like Nord, Kawhi, Roland, Yamaha, anything like that, this stand would, I'm sure, uh, cost somewhere in the three to five hundred dollar range easily. Uh, this thing is just awesome. Uh, so I am sure that a significant component of the price you're paying for this instrument is the fact that it is coming with this stand and with this triple pedal system. Uh, it's solid as a rock. It is a quality, quality, quality product. And I was, you know, I saw photos of this thing when I finally got it in front of me. Uh, I, was, I, I was just blown away. Uh, and when you pick it up, it's like, this is not lightweight. Um, it's certainly manageable by one person, but like I said, this is a quality piece of furniture. Uh, and the piano uh, fits in it really nicely. You don't necessarily have to screw it down. It just sits in some slots. Uh, otherwise, it's really easy to kind of just pick it up and then it just fits back in. So big fan. Uh, the other thing is this is also available in a few different colors. It's available in a white and it's available in this kind of mustardy yellow. Uh, now we didn't get one of those to try out, but I've seen photos of it. Depending on the decor, I, I think the yellow is actually pretty cool. The white's definitely going to be nice and universal. The black is universal. The only thing it's that, that I'm not like the biggest fan of, of the black is that the fingerprints show up so much. And of course, because this is a touch screen and there's so much to use on this piano, your fingers are all over it. So, you know, if you've got a black one, you're, you're gonna wanna give this a wipe, you know, once a week or so, because uh, it's gonna get a little fingerprinty. And I imagine on the white and the yellow, that probably wouldn't really show up um, at all. Uh, if, if not very little. So that is our first look at the Casio PXS 7000. When you take it in totality, uh, the furniture aspect, the solid nature of it, the uh, speaker system, the fact that you've got uh, all of the acoustic piano samples from three different concert grands really meticulously done, uh, and then a super uh, deep menu that's going to let you do all kinds of things on here uh, that you don't, like I haven't had to look at the user manual once to figure out how to do any single thing uh, on here. It really is that easy uh, to use. Um, I could see this thing winning over uh, a few hearts and minds, uh, and I would have to say that I'm now one of them. If it's the first time that you are seeing us here on the channel, I uh, really appreciate if you would hit that subscribe and the notification bell uh, so that we can see you back here for more. We'd love some comments, we'd love to know what you thought of the video or others. Uh, and we'd love to see you back, most importantly of all. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been Marion Pianos on YouTube. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>